Right, hi again everybody. Well, uh, my PhD is, is all about uh, the, late medi the archaeology of the late medieval town and in particular uh, using a multidisciplinary approach to, uh, to look at um, distinctive districts. But I'm also looking at how archaeology and the historic environment has been treated, uh, particularly since the Second World War. And Leicester is one of my four case studies, um, the others being Gloucester, Southampton, and Coventry, which is where I'm from originally. Um, I'm going to focus on mainly on medieval archaeology and standing buildings, and I'm going to be looking mainly at the 60s, which is the time when Comrade Smigelski was the, uh, the chief town planner between, in the decade between 62 and 72. So this quotation here um, was actually from him, and I'll go into that a little bit bit later, I'm actually finding something that he, he says in practice on the historic environment has, has proved very elusive for, for reasons which I'll go on to a bit later on. I should say that before I start that a lot of this information has been um, found from delving through the archives of the Council of British Archaeology, the Society of Protection of Ancient Buildings, the Vernacular Architecture Group municipal records in Leicester and elsewhere, uh, various archaeological societies, and talking to key national figures. So a lot of this information um, has not been published, so hopefully it will be of interest. So what were people saying about changes in Leicester in the 60s? Well, Professor Jack Simmons, uh, writing in 74, his, his, his book about the history of Leicester was quite scathing. He was saying that uh, so much had been destroyed in the past 15 years. He was the professor of history at the University of Leicester here. And then in the famous uh, The Buildings of England series by uh, Pevsner, um, Pevsner, who was, uh, was quite a supporter, in fact, in so many ways of, of modernist buildings and, and town planning, but in the case of Leicester in the western part of the town, um, he was saying that it's almost impossible to comprehend on the ground since the medieval plan has been shattered by a network of mid-20th century roads. The Archaeological Historical Society um, was not very complimentary either. The development of the St Nicholas Circle site for the Holiday Inn, the multi-story car park, is a warning of the huge gaps between civic aesthetics and commercial gain. And one of the things I'm, themes I'm going to be bringing out in this presentation, hopefully, is how a lot of the local amenity societies, historical, um, archaeological societies, fought to save particular buildings and streets, and, and in some cases worked with the, the council. To, uh, and, and so what we see today is partly thanks to them. Um, in the, uh, the, the mid-60s, um, the, the particularly the Southgate Comprehensive Development Scheme completely altered the western part of, um, of, of Leicester. Um, and that's just a, a quick view there. And this is um, what we're seeing then and now, the Southgate Street area. Um, that's an image taken just a few weeks ago. Um, the, as Matt was saying, the, the, um, the medieval town depicted by Flower in the 1820s had long gone, and this uh, photograph at the, at the bottom there on the right, a hundred years later, um, shows changes and some similar buildings from the Flower building, um, but very different today. But a lot of this, of course, had been planned long before um, Comrade Smigulski, um came into office in, in October 62. So I'm hoping to show some of the things that uh, were already in place and some of the things that he changed, or things that, that maybe he could have had an influence over that didn't. Um, so here's the context, very briefly. Um, One of the key issues is the fact that um, the idea of townscapes, so Otto was talking about this earlier, the idea of preserving um, large um, numbers of, of, of buildings which on their own didn't have individual merits, um, but as a whole added to the character of the town, that wasn't really in place in the early 60s when uh, Smigelski came in. 
That was something that emerged later on and was enshrined in law in the Civic Amenities Act in 1967 uh, when conservation areas came in. So a lot of the damage that had been done in the, um, in the uh, western side of the old town had already happened by, the, by that time. Um, urban archaeology was very much, um, uh, it was kind of in its infancy, particularly for the medieval side. We, Matt was talking about Roman archaeology and the, the emphasis really was on Roman archaeology and in, it wasn't until 1971 in Leicester that um, medieval archaeology was given more prominence and it is true that archaeology was well treated in Leicester, it was recognised nationally, I'll be talking a little bit more about this later on, um, but in the time pressures given for development and lack of resource, um, a lot of the medieval laid layers were ignored or ploughed through in a rush to get to the Roman layers and it wasn't until 71 so a year before Smigelski left, that uh, uh, the, the medieval side of uh, archaeology in Leicester was really appreciated. And in particular, the study of vernacular buildings. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what, which de medieval domestic buildings, or what we call vernacular buildings, were still standing in the early 60s. Um, but it wasn't until the mid to late 60s with a series of quite key publications by people like Brunskill and Wood and Charles and Pantin that an archaeological um, look at vernacular buildings was, was really coming to prominence. People didn't really understand them, people didn't appreciate them and more importantly quite a lot of them were hidden behind later brick and stucco facades. Leicester being one of the more prosperous towns in the late 19th century and early 20th century, um, a, a lot of these buildings had been upgraded and so they weren't really recognised or appreciated and quite often they, uh, they, they weren't known about until the actual process of destruction. Um, another thing that uh, uh, was happening, to just set the context very briefly, is that um, and, and what I've been reading through my uh, archival research was a prevailing wisdom in, in many ways for, for modernism. The conservation movement was emerging in the early 60s, it hadn't really reached its zenith um, and huge numbers of listed and non-listed buildings were actually being uh, destroyed in many other towns. So, as I say, the, the medieval uh, Leicester uh, shown by uh, Flower had, uh, had largely gone. This is a picture of Applegate, Shambles Lane. Um, of course, in, in places like York, um, the Shambles, um, which were in a, in a terrible state after the Second World War, have, have been preserved and they're a huge tourist attraction. But uh, in Leicester, they, they, they'd long gone before Spigelsky came to power. Um, and there again, Guildford Lane. Um, as I mentioned, that Leicester had been quite a prosperous uh, town and so a lot of the infrastructure project, projects which characterised Edwardian towns in this country um, featured heavily here and this is Lord's Tower being demolished. Interestingly, um, again looking through the uh, records of the Society of Protection of Ancient Buildings, there was a campaign to save that building but it was in the way by a couple of feet. Um, and the, 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 the local authority at that time was having none of it. Um, quite a few timber frame buildings had survived in, um, you know, this one in High Cross Street um, survived into the 20s and 30s, but as you can see um, by the uh, 50s and 60s they'd actually been uh, covered in, in, in brick but a lot of those buildings actually did have medieval fragments inside um, and the medieval plot system was still intact. And we've been able to uh, plot where a lot of these medieval buildings were. Um, this is a mixture of, um, uh, of buildings that, uh, that still stand where there are fragments and um, where they once existed in the 20th century through archaeological research and through uh, photographs and depictions. This was done in, uh, by the Courtney's. But since then, a few more examples have emerged. Um, and you can see one there at the, at the back of, this is where Ask Pizza is in the High, in the high Street. So fragments did exist. 
So who were the people that were protecting the historic environment, particularly in the, in the 1960s? Well, uh, Leicester, as, as we've seen before, had a long history of uh, local objections to the loss of historic character, going back way back to the, to the 1830s. And unusually for a town like Leicester, it had a very strong um, heritage lobbying uh, body through the, the literary, um, literary and Leicester um, Philosophical Society, the Lytton Phil, and the Leicestershire Archaeological Society. The Lytton Phil had a, 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 were, were, was full of um, town worthies, um, they um, had varied interests, and they were a very strong prefer, um, uh, lobbying group at the beginning. The Archaeological Society had more um, archaeological and standing buildings experts. Quite unusually for, for Leicester, there was a lot of expertise in vernacular standing buildings. So there were a lot of fights going on, um, some successful, some not, um, well before the Second World War. You might call it a kind of a, a conservation society in, in its early forms. But by 1946, the two societies decided to, um, to join forces and, um, uh, and, and fight the, what was then seen to be some radical redevelopment through the uh, city engineer Beckett. Um, the Civic Society um, is quite interesting, the Civic Society because it wasn't formed until 1860 and perhaps that's because of the strength of the Lytton Phil and the Archaeological Society. In other towns, um, civic societies weren't as strong a defenders of the historic environment as you might think. And in fact, there was quite a lot of links between civic societies and town planners. And quite a few of them actually included ex-council officials. Um, so in places like Coventry, for example, I'll go on to a little bit more in a moment, the, um, the civic society grew out of, out of their antiquarian society and had a much broader remit and included ex-town planners who had actually destroyed quite a lot of the, the city's heritage uh, prior to that. In Southampton, the civic society backed an inner um, motorway right through the medieval town and a separate antiquarian society called the Friends of Old Southampton Society set up by the charismatic and um, very famous uh, archaeologist Crawford, he deliberately set up a separate society to fight for historic buildings because he didn't think that um, his, his voice would be heard through the civic society. So it's interesting how, uh, how these things changed in different towns. But it was the archaeological society that took the lead mainly in the 50s and 60s and in fact, um, seeing the destruction of uh, historic buildings actually set up a historic buildings panel under Professor uh, Jack Simmons in, in 1964 and I've been through all of their records uh, to, see, uh, to see what was going on and their battles with the council. And they actually submitted an updated list of 170 buildings <coughs> of historic and architectural interest for protection in 64 and 65 and acted as an unofficial watchdog. Um, they were often being tipped off, actually, from within the council by John Daniel, who actually did this uh, really interesting photograph here of the, uh, of the area around the cathedral, which is eventually uh, redeveloped by uh, this Nicholas Circle. And John Daniel, being a, officially a council employee, was saying in his correspondence that he couldn't really go public with all this because he was employed by the council. But he was doing what he could to tip off the archaeological society so a public campaign could be, could be made to try and save individual buildings. And the first example here, I've got two case studies. The first example is Wigston's house, which is 18 High Cross Street. Now, this had been threatened as early as 1946 because Beckett wanted to build a, a, a road between the West Bridge joining up with High Cross Street, and the, the council wanted to go ahead with this, and the Archaeological Society complained to the ministry, who intervened, and the, the, uh, put a huge amount of pressure on the council to, to, to pause for a while. They did think about creating a kind of a ring road around it, and then the whole scheme uh, fell apart for a while. And then this is one of Smigelski's um, success stories. When he came to power in 62, 
he actually dropped the scheme that uh, Beckett was proposing um, and decided to build the, uh, the Southgate underpass, which actually saved Wigston's house. But it was a, in a very, very vulnerable position for, for many years. As you can see, it was surrounded, the, the, the Wigston's house is in this area, surrounded by derelict buildings, there's lots of vandalism, and the records are saying the Archaeological Society are complaining to the Ministry of Society of Protection of Ancient Buildings, please do something about this building because it's falling apart and sooner or later somebody's going to say it's not worth saving. And thank goodness it was. Um, eventually got saved by ter being turned into a, a costume museum in 1973. But the records are very clear that its future was uncertain right up until that time. In many ways a more interesting example is 38 Southgate Street. Um, now this one was um, a, a 15th century building, um, very well preserved. It was being uh, used as a cobbler's shop by Mr Sherwood and um, it was actually right bang in where the Southgate development area was going to be. And this is a photograph um, in 1962. And during demolition in, in 64, you can see the, the, the medieval timber uh, roofing there. Um, it had been listed in the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act in what they call their supplementary list. So under the 47 Act, grades one and two buildings were to be preserved and they were protected by law. Uh, but anything else would be a kind of a nice to have. But what that was supposed to happen is they were supposed to be recorded um, before being destroyed. So this was an interesting test case about what would happen to this building. Um, and I've, I've looked through the records here. Um, in 1961, John Daniel from the museum um, was appe appealing to a local contractor called Courtry to actually get his advice and actually go into the building to actually see how important it was. And he made an appeal to Society of Protection of Ancient Buildings who said, yes, this is a very important medieval building. It must be preserved at all costs. And then um, in September 1963, the Archaeological Society took up the matter with Smigilski directly. And they, they suggested that just for the sake of two or three feet, that building could be saved. And this is the only letter I've ever found in my researches from Smigelski um, on a particular issue. And this is where my quote comes from. He says, thank you for your letter. Um, very, you know, I've got sympathy with your case. Um, be good to, to meet up and talk about it, but there's nothing I can do. It actually got demolished in 1964. Um, and there's a question about whether he could have saved it or not. I mean, I, I have seen in, uh, a lot of the Southgate development wasn't actually uh, built until 67. Uh, there were lots of chopping and changing. It could have been saved, but if it had been saved, it would have been very incongruous um, amongst very modern buildings. It would have been isolated on its own. And this is a very typical example of what was happening up and down the country. What do you do with a, a very important medieval building um, um, that's just on its own in the middle of a development area? Just briefly, because I know I'm, uh, I'm going to run out of time at this rate, but uh, um, Smigelsi did have a very, very um, enlightened view in theory, certainly, um, and again in practice in some areas to the historic environment. <coughs> In his traffic plan in 64, he actually said that the environment come first, comes first and traffic afterwards. Um, and in his uh, plans, he actually set out in detail to the black background to the historic development of the town and the effect of the uh, topography of the area. Um, and he was very keen on preserving the, the city, the, the medieval features such as the clock tower area, which he re regarded as the emotional heart of the city. So he did very, very well with the eastern part of the city, um, with, the, with the marketplace, which he preserved against a lot of opposition. 
But on the west side, the city did suffer back very badly. It was a question of balance between the historic environment and the, 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 the desperate needs of, of, of the traffic. So on the western side of the old town, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the houses on the west side of High Cross Street, which looked very run-down 19th century buildings, did have a lot of medieval features. Here's one in uh, 125 High Cross Street. Before destruction, again, John Daniel managed to, to sneak into the building and take a photograph. And this is a, a roof timber prop, perhaps, from a church, but it did have a lot of medieval features. On the other hand, of course, a lot of these houses did have very terrible conditions, these slum conditions. This is one from High Cross Street, so something did need to be done. So this is you know, a very brutal look at perhaps his, his legacy. This is what we see today. Um, the, the Holiday Inn um, and uh, the, the South Gates area. Um, as I say, in, in the eastern side of, the, 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 of, of Leicester, a lot was done. And of course, New Walk is a very famous uh, um, example of, of his good work. Um, and he did want to do more. There's no question about that. He was prevented, I think, by the, uh, the, the, the economy. Uh, his plans were rather ambitious. But can we say that what was built instead of some of the medieval um, areas were of better quality? He himself, describing the um, Holiday Inn, which actually rescued the St. Nicholas Circle scheme at a time when it was really struggling, was... <coughs> Kind of with rather understatement, not the most attractive scheme that could have emerged. <laughs> <laughs> also, the Highgate, um, High Cross Street, um, had it been say, had it been uh, postponed? I mean, there was a lot of problem was that was the destruction of the, the a lot of these buildings um, uh, that were left with open spaces for years and years and years without development. I think a lot of the destruction may have happened. Um, perhaps prematurely, had some of the areas like High Cross Street been kept, it might have been saved by um, a conservation area and, under the, uh, the Act of 67. So for the sake of two or three years, things might have been a little bit different. But if we thought things were bad in Leicester, um, this is what was going on in Coventry. And this is my town, um, and I grew up in Coventry in the 60s, so I remember some of it. Um, Coventry had been a much bigger medieval town than Leicester. It was the, the regional capital. It was Leicester's regional capital. Um, it was famously uh, bombed very heavily in the Second World War, which meant that the radical town planners led by Donald Gibson had a blank slate to actually redevelop the whole of the central area. And the, the local authority, um, emboldened by the city's um, martyr status, overrode up objections from the government and from local opposition and went ahead with the, with the, uh, with the scheme. No archaeology was done until the 60s, none whatsoever, so I think Leicester's record is exceptionally good in that regard. But the amazing thing is that um, a huge number of vernacular houses actually still survived. So in 1958 there was a survey done of no less than 100 uh, 14th, 15th and 16th century houses survived um, but then six years later a similar survey was done and only 34 had survived so um, and what was happening in between those times was the building of the inner ring road so we're talking about we were talking earlier in the presentation about uh, uh, the, the needs of the traffic and inner ring roads and we, you know, we, we've seen what's been going on in Leicester in Coventry it was incredibly destructive of the historic environment. Um, in one area, and the West Spon Street, I've counted 18 medieval buildings that were today would be prized were completely destroyed by that record. Um, so the solution from the council was to create the Spon Street Townscape Scheme. And there was an appeal here from the uh, local archaeological society um, for funds. And the idea was to restore some of the buildings in situ. And the first one is uh, number 169, which the council paid for. They then refused to pay for any more and appealed for funds. And the idea was that if another building was in the way of their development, they would pack it up 
label the, um, uh, the timbers, store it for another day, and then put it up in Spon Street. And this is an example here of a merchant's house, three-story merchant's house, which was taken from the centre of the town and re-erected um, in, um, in the 70s. Um, it's good that it's been saved, but it looks very incongruous. You'd never see a three-story merchant's house in a medieval suburb like that. So, um, also the idea that this was become a tourist attraction didn't really emerge. It, it's, it's completely cut off from the rest of the city. So, um, two schools of thought. You know, one is that least buildings were saved, but on the other hand, um, historically not very accurate. And the person responsible for this, Freddie Charles, was a member of the Society of Protection of Ancient Buildings, and I've seen their correspondence. They were quite vitriotic, vitriolic about the whole thing, and he actually got drummed out of the society. Um, so that was Coventry's solution. Um, rather than destroy a building, preserve it by, by taking it apart, storing it, and re-erecting it somewhere else. Um, and they meet in the Ring Road, it, it's still a little bit of an eyesore today to, to a certain degree and here's the very in, important uh, Whitefriars Monastery, one of the most important remains of, of a, a medieval friar, friary in the country, blighted by being right next to the inner ring road. I mean that kind of building would be prized elsewhere but uh, unfortunately not here. So what was happening elsewhere, very briefly, um, the seriousness of this situation um, was that uh, the Council of British Archaeology decided to set up um, a, a committee um, with the secretary, uh, Martin Biddle, the famous uh, archaeologist, who actually, uh, the, the committee did a, a survey and they went out to the local authorities of 51 historically important towns to find out, A, how much they were going to be spending on archaeology and standing buildings, and two, what were their development plans and therefore the threats. And their conclusions came out in 1972 in a very impor important and influential report, which basically said that at the current rate of progress, the most important towns of all historical periods will be lost, lost to archaeology in 20 years, if not before. So the situation in the Smigelski years was absolutely critical. And uh, you can see it in, in many towns. So, for example, in Gloucester, um, very important, like Leicester, Roman and uh, medieval town, continuously occupied, occupied for uh, 1,800 years. It had 10 acres or 25% of its intramural area developed between 60 and 71 um, with the construction of uh, destructive basements and piling. It destroyed the archaeology completely. Of 603 listed buildings, 150 were demolished in that period. Um, and there was such a public outcry that actually in 1972, the year that Smigelski left in Leicester, the, the Civic Trust in Gloucester was set up. And the story from then on is one of great cooperation between the local authority and the, and the, the um, heritage bodies. And saving those buildings, the ones that were left in 72, has, has been seen in hindsight to be a very enlightened thing and it's been very good for the, the Gloucester economy. So briefly to conclude, uh, much has been said about Leicester's transformation in the 60s and the effect on the historic environment. Um, when he, when Smigelski joined the council in 62, it was the high watermark of post-war urban development. Um, the redevelopment of bomb-damaged towns like Coventry had already happened by then, and a second wave was starting, largely centred around the urgent need for the motor car. The prevailing wisdom amongst la both Labour and Conservative governments was for modernism, and the conservation movement was emerging, but it hadn't reached its zenith. So therefore, Smigelski was ahead of his time when he published his traffic plan. He said all the right things about the importance of a sense of place and townscape, and he was very sensitive to the rate of destruction of listed buildings, and quite often quoted statistics about the number of buildings that were actually being destroyed. Um, it also has to be said that most of Leicester's ordinary medieval buildings had long gone by the time he took up his position, 
But did he practice what he preached in terms of protecting the historic environment in Leicester in the 60s? And was what replaced the old town better than what went before? I think his record on the east side of town is good, particularly with the marketplace and with, uh, with New Walk. But on the, old, on the western side of town, um, I think uh, we can all see the, the results and, and some of the mistakes are now being corrected. Um, he did what he could in the, power, in the face of powerful modernist orthodoxy and I suspect that he stuck his neck out to, to save individual historic buildings. Um, the Sun Alliance is a very famous example but I think looking through the correspondence he didn't really want to commit himself in writing. I suspect he did do a lot of meeting with um, the defenders of the historic environment in private and expressed his sympathies. Um, but he felt there wasn't much he could do. Um, certainly he stopped what could have been a, an even more disastrous situation with the Beckett plan if that had been fully implemented. Um, but writing a year after his departure in 1972, he did admit that a lot of the development had not been what he'd hoped for. Um, um, he could point to su some successes but the whole of the medieval, the western side of the medieval town had been destroyed. The medieval street pattern had gone. Um, and the question has to be asked, was the Leicester of 1972, when he left, better than the Leicester of 1962? That's something we can debate tomorrow. Thank you.